Can we turn our Bibles to John chapter 21? We'll read from verse 1. We'll probably stop at about verse 14. I'm going to read the NIV version. Okay, we have it. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus. You know, in some churches, they call him Doubting Thomas. Doubting Didi. Let's move on. No corny jokes today. Okay. Nathaniel from Cana in, in Galilee. The sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which by the way is John, and that's how he refers to himself in the scripture that he wrote. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. I think it's pretty funny, you know. Tell somebody, say, I'm the one that Jesus loves. So the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not that far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus was a personal chef. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. And so, a bit of background. This is the last chapter in the book of John. And actually, in some translations... Before you read the chapter, it says it's an epilogue. So an epilogue is something that happens after the story has pretty much concluded. But there's just a bit more information that they want to give you. So in John chapter 20, if you read John chapter 20 to the end, you see at the end of that, he says, you know, uh, Jesus did so many, you know, after Jesus resurrected, he said he did so many more miracles, um, so many more signs. But I wrote these signs down that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he's the Messiah. And then he gets into this story about the third time that Jesus uh, appeared to the disciples after he resurrected. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I struggled finding a title for my message today. How many people saw the, the title, I mean, the, the poster on Instagram? Okay. The truth is, I struggled finding the title for the message because everything that I came up with as a title was very heavy. It was very dark. It was very depressing. Because we've been through a tough season. I mean, can we call a spade a spade? Yeah. So I struggled with the title. And I went through. And I even had to check with one or two people that I would check with. And I said, hey, what do you think about this? They said, ah, failure, depression, bounce back. You know, it was just, it was a bit much. But eventually the title came. But further than that, I actually struggled with whether... I should speak today in the first place. Um, you guys are my family, so I'll be honest with you. PB and I spoke about today's service weeks ago. This was to be our Thanksgiving service. You understand? 
after the election is over and we come and we're celebrating and we're thanking God and I was just going to give a short charge to say see what the Lord has done are you are you with me and then you know we use that to build up your faith and give God some much due and necessary praise and then we finish the service and I go to Abuja and start looking for apartments and uh, office space and things of that nature and when the events of the last week you know started playing out in real time you know you know sometimes life can come at you fast where it just the, it's like the wind is knocked out of your sails and you're just you're trying to even understand what was going on and you know a few days into it i started thinking to myself okay you know i'm going to need to take somewhat of a break and i still might um but i immediately was i, I came this close to calling pastor blessed up and saying you know bro uh, you know i know we agreed that i would speak on sunday but i need some time to catch my breath and just analyze and process what's happening and i came this close to picking up the phone and i promise you it felt like god held my hand and god said to me so is it only faith when you win is it only faith when things work out exactly the way that you had planned do you only give me thanksgiving when you know i perform exactly according to your script because you know sometimes we've we've misconstrued what faith really means we we we've turned god into a genie in a bottle where we you know we we have our prayer request and we have the script and we we know the timing and we know what he's going to do so we lay it at his feet rightfully so and then when it doesn't quite pan out like that it's like we don't know what to do next we don't know where to go and god said you know so so is it only faith when when you win because the truth is your faith in god does not stop you from hurting but it helps you heal and it helps you deal your faith in God is not just about when everything is rosy and it's a walk in the park and there are good times you see, you see the message of Christianity is not that you accept God into your life and then he helps you avoid trouble and stress and dysfunction no it doesn't you don't get to avoid it but your faith in God helps you transform it it helps you process it it helps you understand it it helps you overcome it are you with me this morning you know we sing songs like we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house you know the song now millennials of the lord Abby? we bring the sacrifice sometimes we sing the song and we don't pay attention to what the word is saying sometimes praise is a sacrifice sometimes you know a sacrifice costs you something are you hearing me this morning sometimes praise is born out of pain is born out of confusion is born out of frustration is born out of you doing everything that you knew to do and the bible says when you have done all to stand stand and so this service PB and I discussed it. We planned it ahead of time. It was supposed to be a Thanksgiving service. Ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. It's still a Thanksgiving service. It's still a Thanksgiving service. Are you hearing me, somebody? You see, because I've spent many days, many Sundays right here teaching you what I've learned about Christ. And about life I've shared from many personal examples my wife and I it was in this church that we told you the testimony of Zaya and what God did and guess what it's the same God we serve the same God he doesn't change he's the same yesterday today and forever and so you have learned from our victories and our wins and our good times but you also have to learn about the low moments too. And I pray that God will use what he's doing with us to teach you about what he's doing with you. Because how many people in here have ever had an unanswered prayer? 
How many people in here have ever, you, you know, you expected something and it, it looked like it was going to work out and it just didn't? For me, it might be a campaign. For you, it might be a marriage, a relationship, a marriage that hasn't come, a marriage that has died, a child that has not come, a child that has died. A job that you have not gotten yet. Finances that have not worked out. Are you hearing me? Am I talking to myself? That's why I called it faith after a fall. Because what we are going to do today, let's have an agreement. You will substitute fall for whatever that thing is in your life. Whatever that moment is, that painful thing, that thing that you don't quite understand. You know, sometimes when you are disappointed, you can quickly move into the place where you lose the expectation and you stop talking about it because you don't really have the words, right? So you, you, don't, you don't pray about it anymore. You say that we're praying about it. It's just like when people come to me and say, our thoughts and prayers are with you. How many, you know, do you really pray? We know we say it all the time when something bad happens thoughts and prayers thoughts and prayers we type it in a tweet we put it on instagram and we move on in the instant so it's almost like we've become numb to praying and to asking for things because sometimes our expectations are cut short are you with me what am i saying god will permit you to go through a season of trial because there's something, there's a character that he's trying to build in you that you need for where he's taking you to. And you know, trials, tell somebody, say trials are by design. You know, we, we read scripture in hindsight because we know how the story ends. So we know that Jesus was born. We know that he died. We know that he's resurrected. And, we, and that's where we, 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 we kind of, that's the foundation that we build our faith upon, right? But for a second, let's try and put ourselves in the place of the disciples who were living this in real time and didn't have a New Testament to open. They were living it. They didn't have a book of John chapter 21. So, if you go back a few verses, you will see that Jesus actually told Peter that all of this is going to happen. And he says, Satan has requested to sift you like wheat. I was so curious about that. I went to find out what that means. What does it mean to sift you like wheat? The process of sifting wheat is a process where the chaff, the outer shell, everything that's around the wheat is removed. So they first, they laid the wheat on a stone and they beat it with a flail. And then they throw the wheat in the air and they use things to blow it and they use just so that everything that they don't want is removed until only the wheat remains and it falls to the ground and it's at that point that the wheat is suitable for use so a trial is designed is permitted by God because because God is trying to remove that outer shell everything that you don't need for the next level that you are going to He's going to permit life to take it away from you. So it might be your status. It might be your version of a dream. It might be your attitude, your insecurity, your fear, your anger, your lust, your sin, your shame. You know, we, we come to Christ at the point of salvation. And there are two things, well, three things that God is trying to achieve with us. Salvation. Everybody say salvation. salvation. Sanctification. sanctification. And glorification. So salvation happens in an instant, right? You give your life to Christ. It's like you're in a courtroom. You're supposed to go to jail. And the judge says, you know what? I'm not sending you to jail. You know, I'm, you know, I'm canceling your sentence. There's leniency. You're free to go. That's salvation. It happens in an instant. But you see, sanctification is the process by which you become what you already are in the spirit. So at salvation, your spirit is born again. You are, you are in right standing with God. The spiritual realm has to acknowledge your standing with God. But sanctification is the process. why the Bible says your soul is being saved. There are things that you are going through in the earth. As God is shaping your character, shaping, you know, building your character, changing the person that you are. And you can only, I say this all the time. 
Great destinies require great character. But character cannot be prayed into you. It can only be built. It can only be built by going through trials. So God will permit those trials to come. God will permit the trials to come. Am I talking to somebody this morning? And what we have to understand is that until we get to the place where we trust God infinitely and we submit to the process, you can struggle, you can run, you can move from place to place, but you will keep coming back to where God wants you to be until he feels like, okay, now you are ready for where you are going. It's just like Jacob, right? Jacob was a schemer. He was a plotter. He'd stolen the birthright. He'd stolen the blessing. And he had become successful. He was a wealthy man. God still blessed him. That's what grace does. Even with everything that you have, packaging and all of that, God will still bless you. Things were still going. Until the point where God said, okay, now go back. Leave Laban and go back home. Problem. Back home is where Esau was planning to kill him. And the Bible says that he got to that place and he sent his family ahead because he got to the point where he knew he could go no further unless God took him from there. And the Bible says God came and wrestled with Jacob. It doesn't say Jacob wrestled with God. It says the angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob. So it's like God, God became his opposition to say, I know this is what you want to do, but no, we're going to stay here and we're going to deal with some things here. And it was at that point that God changed his destiny. So what am I saying? God permits trials. Satan requested to sift Peter like wheat. Now, there's a question that I think we all occasionally have to ask and, and find the answer to. Why Sometimes these trials are very painful. They're tough. They're tough to deal with. They're tough. People ask me how I'm doing. I say, if I tell you that it's not a tough time, I'll be lying. But I trust God and I'm okay. And that's the, the honest answer. So why do the trials come? Ladies and gentlemen, trials come because of the word of God over your life because of the word of God in your heart, because of the promise of God as to who you are and what he wants to use you to do. The answer is in Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, it's the parable of the sower, right? The Bible says the sower sows the seed and the seed falls on different kinds of ground. Some falls by the wayside, the birds snatch it up. Some fall on stony ground where there's a little soil and the word springs up for a while. But the trials, in, in verse 16, it says the trials and persecution come because of the word. Are you with me this morning? It is the word of God in your heart and over your life that the enemy is attacking. When, when uh, Satan came to Eve, what did he say? He said, did God really say? The target is always the word of God. Because the word produces faith. Faith comes by and hearing by so the word of God produces faith and it is that faith in your heart when the word of God hits that soil that produces fruit and ultimately that's what the devil doesn't want to happen so the devil's intention is to use the trial to break you to destroy you to steal kill and destroy but God's intention is to use the trial to break away what doesn't need to be there so that you are a better, stronger, wiser, more successful person so that you are somebody that can achieve the purpose that he's planned for you. Are you with me this morning? And so this scripture, Peter, you know, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead. This is the third time he's appearing to them. And it's a little curious because you already know that Jesus has risen from the dead, right? I mean, the disciples already knew that. They'd seen him twice. But they still didn't know what to do next. They had no plans. They had no... They, they were confused. Because, you know, the disciples had a different vision of what Jesus came to do. Didn't matter how many times he told them. They still envisioned the Messiah because of the way scripture is written. They thought the Messiah came to break them free from slavery. 
to Rome. They thought he was going to be a military leader. He would be the ruler of Israel. He'd be the next king and he would free them. So they had a pattern in their mind that he was supposed to follow. And so while to us today, the cross represents comfort and it represents our crown. At that time, the cross was a question mark. It represented a broken promise. It represented confusion. So, okay, you died, you rose. That's great. So what do I do now? What, what next? So what do you do when you don't know what to do? That's where we're going today. Are we together? Yeah. Everybody say step one. You know me, I'm a teacher. If you're if you, have, if you are new here in the water brook, they call me P Banks because the P is for professor. I'm a teacher, amen? So what do you do when you don't know what to do? Step one, say step one. Step one. Do what you know. Do what you know. Tell somebody, say, do what you know. Peter said what? I'm going fishing. The disciples said, okay, we'll go with you. After all, we have to eat. We've lost everything. Everything that we banked our lives on, everything that we bet on. I left my business. I left my family. I left everything to follow this path. And now, it, it's a, it looks like it has gone up in smoke. So what do we do? Jesus has risen from the dead. That's great. I know he's real. I know he's God. But I don't know what God wants to do with me. I don't know what this means for me. So step one, do what you know. Peter said, I'm going fishing. Guess what? When you do what you know, God will meet you there. Are you hearing me, somebody? When you do what you know, trust that God will meet you there. If you've ever been in a sunken place, in a painful place, the natural inclination you have is to curl up and cry and stay there. It's a completely natural reaction. But guess what? The most important thing you can do in a sunken place is to keep moving. Yeah. So get up, get out, do something. Do what you know. Peter, it was fishing. Me, I'm standing here by the grace of God on the strength of the Holy Spirit giving you the word of God. Do what you know. Go back to business. Go back to work. Go to, go to the gym. Walk out. Are you with me, somebody? Just do what you know. When you do what you know, Jesus will meet you there. Peter said, I'm going fishing. They went out. Even the one that they knew, they were not very good at it because they, they, say they went all night and they caught nothing. But guess what? Jesus had made provision for them there. Right? They're on the boat. He says, hey, Toss your net on the other side. There was provision. They come to the shore. He says, bring the... Peter heard that it was Jesus. Jumped out of the boat, swam. He said, bring the fish. He went back, got in the boat, dragged the fish. They got to the shore. He was already cooking breakfast with fish and bread for them. So there was already provision. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am I making sense this morning? Tell somebody, say, do what you know. Say it again. Say, do what you know. Another interesting thing ab about this, and I'll just give you this on the side. These are people who had sp spent three and a half years with Jesus Christ every day. They were following him. They were his disciples. But the reason the resurrected Christ, they didn't really recognize. Do you ever think about how weird that is? You spent three days with somebody, I mean three and a half years with somebody, and then all of a sudden the person shows up. And you don't really know who he is. So, to me, that means there was something about the resurrected Christ. The, 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 you know, the, the, the resurrected form of Christ that they just couldn't recognize immediately. Something had changed about him. He still had the, the, the nail holes in his hands and all of that. But he was, he was different, right? It was hard to recognize. What am I saying? Sometimes it's hard to recognize God in your situation. But you know this, he got up, so you will get up too. He got up, so you will get up too. Even though it's hard to see him, it's hard to hear him, it's hard to understand that he's there. But you have to trust that because he resurrected, I will resurrect too. If you think my story is over, you don't know my God and you don't know me. You know, when, when Jesus said earlier that Satan had requested to sift Peter like wheat, it, 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 there was a sense of deja vu because I remember that there was somewhere else 
that God, this kind of conversation happened where Satan said, let me throw some trials at this guy. I bet you he will throw in the towel. And it's in the most painful book in the Bible, the book of Job. I almost want to believe that Job was fictional because it's painful. It's, am I lying? It's not a fictional story, but you know when you read something and it's that, it's that difficult that you are just like, ha, ha. And in that one, the devil tells God, he says, listen, this guy is serving you now. He's your, he's your guy. He's your boy. Yeah, because you have a hedge of protection around him. Let me throw some trials at him. Then you will see he will curse you. And God says what? Oh, really? He says, go ahead. So here's my thing. God, if the devil does not bring me up. You know, you know actually, the devil, it was God that pointed Job out to, to Satan. Because it says, Satan came into the presence of God. And God said, so where have you been? And he says, oh, you know, I'm just doing what I do. Just roaming the earth, just hanging out, you know, being me. And then God says, oh, but have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen Banky W's campaign? Have you seen the young people that are right? He says, God points Job out and says, look at my guy. Look at my guy. He's, uh, he's serving me, he's singing in church, he's serving, he's working, he's doing everything he's supposed to do. And the devil says, ah, but let me, let me test him, let me give him small trial. Here's my thing, God, if the devil did not bring up my name, don't offer me. I'm okay. I, I'm, Baba, I'm meant for soft life. Can I get a witness in this place? If, if the devil say he's just doing, don't offer me, I'm more... You know, they say things like, oh, you know when you are going through this, that's when you hear all the motivational speech in the world. People come to say, and say, no, no, sir, God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldier. You are like, who told you the road strong soldier here? Am I telling the truth? And so, the devil says, I'll throw some trials at this guy. He will throw in the towel. And you know the crazy thing about Job? Go back and check it. In the first two chapters of Job, Satan is very prevalent. He's, you see him a lot. You see him coming to God. God says, you can do this. He goes, he tries something, he comes back to God again. Do you understand? After those first two chapters in Job, you don't see Satan anymore. Do you know what you see? His friends. Satan now manifests through the words of people. So that's my second point. Be careful who you listen to. When you don't know what to do, be careful who you listen to. Be careful, hear me. Be careful who you allow to tell you who you are. Be careful who you allow to tell you that this is what is happening to you and this is what... Because Satan is not there. But what happens? His friends come. One of them comes from a self-righteous place and says, eh, you know, these kinds of things, don't another one comes to, oh, this, in my experience, this is what has happened. He, eh, if you had done it like this, or if you didn't do that, then he, the, everybody has medicine after death. Hear me. Be careful who you listen to. Let me tell you a trade secret that I use to preserve my mental health. When I'm trending, ask my wife, what do I do? I turn off all social media. Whether it is good, whether it is bad, I'm not interested. You know why? Because I have learned not to get my validation from the comment section. And I have learned not to accept condemnation from the comment section. Because my Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to the... So you can say whatever you like. It's not my business. You can say whatever you want. But it's not my business. I get my validation and my instructions from God. And as long as he continues instructing me and guiding me, I'm okay. Say what you like. Make up any story you want. Insult me. Drag me. Throw death on my name. I'm okay. Listen. God will sacrifice your reputation at the cost of trying to build your character. Because we're always so concerned. You know the only reason I know that I'm being talked about on social media is because a few friends and family will now call me and say, ah, by the way, this is happening, you know, they said this. Are you going to respond? There's somebody said that. Can you come say, ah, I say, 
Am I making sense this morning? I shut my social media off because I need to, the Bible says guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. Don't allow, don't feast on the condemnation that the enemy is bringing. Don't feast, don't, oh, it's like you people don't understand me. Are you hearing me, somebody? Be careful who you're listening to. Tell somebody, say, be careful. Yeah. Say it like that. Say, be careful. be careful. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you know, we wonder why the depression is at an all-time high in the world today. I've said this before. You ever think that there's a reason why your timeline is called a feed? It's your feed. It's what you're feeding yourself with. You're feasting your soul. Even if, you're, even if they're not dragging you, you're feeding yourself with other people's lives, other people's stories, other people's highlights. Sometimes they're not even showing you what they are going through. They are just picking moments. And you are using that to feed your soul. You cannot spend all day in a trash can and wonder why you stink. You cannot spend all... Oh, maybe they didn't hear me here. Did you hear me here? You can't spend all day in a trash can and wonder why you smell. So you cut it off. You be careful who you listen to. Tell somebody, step two. Be careful who you listen to. I bet you at this time in Peter and the disciples' lives, the chatter had started, right? Jesus had even risen from the dead, but not everybody knew it. So I bet you if they went around, they would hear, eh, eh, Chebi, you were the one that said you were doing, Chebi, you said God said that you should do this. Chebi, ladies and gentlemen, that God said does not mean that there will not be storms. Sometimes it is in answering God that you will encounter a storm. But to the human mind, that storm is a sign that that the presence of a storm means the absence of God. It's not true. Sometimes the presence of God means the storm will come. That's why it's important to be careful who you listen to. That's why you have to spend time in the word of God. You have to feed your soul with the word of God. The reason I'm standing, the reason I'm alive today is because of the word of God. The reason I'm able to stand here and speak to you is because of the word of God. It's the, that's where we draw strength. When, when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, he was not just talking about physical bread. Because he says, I am the bread. And Jesus is the word of, the word of God is bread. So I need the word of God for today. I need the word to tell somebody, say, I need a word for today. You cannot go all week long and the word that you got on Sunday is what you are now depending on for Monday. To, you will run out of breath. You will run out of bread. You will run out of air. Are you hearing me, somebody? So be careful who you listen to. Holy Spirit, help me. Let me show you something in first, quickly. 1 first Peter 1.7 First Peter 1 7 it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ the it says your faith is precious do you know that your faith is the most valuable thing that you have it's more valuable than go it's more valuable than money you know money can fail you. What just happened in Nigeria a few weeks, the last few weeks? They, all, they immediately said, this money is no longer, right? So it's possible to have money and not be able to use it. Or to have money and it's not even valid anymore in a moment. But your faith works anywhere, anytime. Your faith is what is valuable. Hallelujah. So step one was what? Do what you know. Step two was what? Be careful who you listen to. Step three. Love God and love people. Somebody say it with me. Say love God and love people. And by extension, serve God 
and serve people. How many people know that that's the mission? To love and serve God. To love and serve people. So the route may have taken a bit of a detour, but the mission remains the same. I found so many interesting things about this scripture. In verse 5, Jesus called them friends. He said, friends, have you any fish? Now, it's fantastic that he calls them friends because these are the same people that denied him. These are the same people that disassociated themselves from him. These are the same people that deserted him in the moment that he needed it the most. Because yes, he was God, but he was 100% man. And it is painful when people that you expect to stand with you and to ride with you and to hold you down and they leave you. Because that's what human beings, we're, we're imperfect people, we're flawed. But here he comes back and he calls them friends. And the, the more amazing thing is this. If you keep reading, and we don't have the time, but if you keep reading from that verse where we stopped, from verse 14 through, I think, 17, you see that Jesus goes into this conversation with Peter. I need to do a whole message on Peter. Maybe next week or whenever PB says it's okay. The next thing is Jesus goes into this conversation with Peter and he says, do you love me? And he says, yes. He says, feed my sheep. He says, do you love me? And he says, yes. He says, uh, you know, take care of my lambs. You know, and they have this interchange where three times Jesus is talking about, do you love me? If so, then do this. And when I was growing up, I was taught that the love, the word love in Greek means different things. You know, there's the family kind of love, there's the brother kind of love, there's the agape kind of love. And so when Jesus was saying it, he was using each time. And then I realized that when Jesus was on earth, he didn't speak Greek. So it's not a vocabulary lesson about love. The significance is not in the words, it's in the numbers. Because Peter denied Jesus three times. This was the third time Jesus was appearing after he rose. And he gave him grace for every time that he had let him down. Did you catch that? Some people caught it. It's like you wanted to appreciate, but you heard yourself. Let me say it again. Peter denied Jesus how many times? This was the third time that Jesus had risen. I mean, sorry. The third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had risen. And then Jesus, in his conversation with Peter, gave him a moment of grace for every time that Peter had let him down. Which means that every time that we fall short, there's grace for that. Every time that we come up short, there's grace for that. Every time that things don't work out or you make a mistake, or there's grace for that. There's love for that. The Bible says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other created. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's what this entire thing is about. It's about the love of God. Amen, somebody. The Bible says, I love, we love because he first loved us. Amen. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is when, I think it's Paul in the book of Romans, and he says, and these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Here's what I've learned. Faith works. Hope waits. Love labors. I learned it from a teacher. His name is Pastor Had Ramsey. Faith works. Hope waits. Love labors. So in this moment, having done all to stand, we are standing. But we have faith, we have hope, and we have love. And so because of our faith, we continue to work. Because of our hope, we continue to wait. You know, waiting on God is not like waiting on a bus. It's not sitting in one place crying and yeah, if you have to cry, cry. And I've cried this week, I'll tell you the truth. In my quiet time with God, I shed some tears. But waiting on God, that's why the Bible says, they that wait on the Lord 
will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings. That's motion now. Is that not motion? They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and it so so it's not waiting on a bus where you are where you say, okay, I'm just gonna stay in this place until the bus comes. No, waiting on God means I'm in motion and God will meet me along the way and he will give me the strength to keep going. Are you hearing me this morning? Are you hearing are you hearing me, Waterbrook? So these three things remain faith, hope, and love. Because of our faith, we will continue to work. Because of our hope, we will continue to wait. Because of our love, we will continue to labor. That's why it's called a labor of love. So our campaign office is not shutting down. It's going to become a community center. Our service to God and to country does not cease because we did not win a seat. Because if our service to God and to country depends on whether or not we got a seat in government, then we don't deserve a seat in the first place. So we continue to work. We continue to serve. We continue to provide whatever we can provide to move this thing along. Are you hearing me this morning? Ladies and gentlemen, remember when we did our clothing drive? This Easter, we're doing another clothing drive. We're going to gather. So if you have clothes that are good, that are in good condition, please don't bring anything that you will not wear yourself. But sometimes you have some nice things that you have not used in a while. and you, or Maybe you have even used it, but you feel like you can part with it. Okay? Bring it in. We'll put, we'll send, we'll, we'll put the information and bring it to our campaign office. Our campaign office is not closing down. It's going to become a community service center where we will do food drives and clothing drives. We will do a technology hub where young people can get access to services. We will continue to be a part of the change that we seek in this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes dreams don't work out because your dream is too low. You set the bar too low. So we let go, we let God, and we allow him to take us to where he's taking us to. I'll close with this point. Sometimes your disappointment is just a divine detour on your path towards destiny. God told Paul that you are going to be brought before Caesar in Rome. Next thing, Paul gets arrested. They're on the sea. The, the, the waves are beating the boat. The boat is turning. They, are not, they can't even talk less of where they thought they were going to Italy. They are start going in other places. What happens? Paul says, I, my God told me that I'm going to go to this place. So he's not only in charge of my destination, he's in charge of the journey that takes me there. So it's not a disappointment, it's a divine detour. Somebody say it, say it's not a disappointment. It's a divine detour. Say it now, say it with your chest like you mean it. So what did they do on the boat? Read the scripture when you have time. It says they dropped the sails and they let the wind take them where it would. They ended up going to the island of Malta where Paul continued to do what he knew, continued to preach. People got saved. God brought miracles. The destination was still the same. The journey was just different. Are you hearing me this morning? So it's not a disappointment, ladies and gentlemen. Hear me. It's a divine detour. Sometimes you just have to learn to drop the sail. It's like when they, when they brought Jesus, they wanted to take Jesus to the cross. The disciples brought out their swords. Peter brought out the sword. He cut somebody's ear. He said, listen, if it's going down, it's going down. We move. Let's go. Right? But Jesus said, mm -mm. sometimes it's okay to drop your sword. It's okay. And instead of fighting, just flow. Instead of fighting, just flow. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to flow. We're going to do what we know. We're going to be careful who we listen to. And we're going to love God and love people and serve God and serve people until our dying day. God bless you. Thank you so much.